Thanks for taking part in the Wrexham.com General Election 2019 Q&A videos. Uh, we'll dive straight in. Thank you. Uh, Definitely. Two weeks ago, we yes. were preparing questions to ask Nathan Gill. Definitely. Uh, as he was the declared candidate for the Brexit Party in Wrexham. But, so before we crack on, where did he go and how did you oh. end up in the chair instead? Car Philly is where he went. And I got it purely because I met somebody eight months ago campaigning in South Wales. Said I'd chosen Wrexham as my first seat, my first choice as a candidate. Didn't get it. They said fortuitous maybe you'll get it. Went into London to sign my papers at Tiverton and Honiton and happened to meet the same person and said, you know, I really do want Wrexham. She went, it's yours if you want it. That's the only reason I'm sitting here. Well, it's not the only reason, it's because I got selected as a candidate and I have a lot of links here that the other eight people who wanted it didn't have. So from my point of view and from the parties, I have the best link to this town. So yes. Moving on to yourself. Yes, um, certainly. Are you able to tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, any political history, well, and why you've got the political leanings that you do? I was very strong in campaigning with Edward Heath back in the 70s and 80s. Went to his 50-year anniversary when he, with the party, and I decided that the Conservatives left my view of life 20 years ago, uh, as they started hammering everybody for everything. When I finally met my partner now, which is Rhiannon, she lives here local, she's from the far left, I'm from the far right. We met in the middle. It's about the country, it's about the freedom. And we both said, we cannot have foreigners, I'll put it bluntly, ruling this country. We can make better decisions. So that's where I come from in terms of why I stand here today. My career has been a lawyer working for local authorities all over the country, about 20 of them. And I always deal with children or adults and I see the real problems. And I know that I can't change them as a solicitor, but I can from parliament. And I know the real issue is money. That's, that's, that's the catch question. I know all the candidates are going to raise different issues, but from my point of view, it's the funding in the right place at the right time. It's not just saying we're going to save two or 300,000 today, which is what the local council are doing with various uh, schemes they have to help disabled people. It's saying what's the long-term cost. And I discovered when I practiced that if a local authority spent a bit more on say a mother who's having a third or fourth child removed, you could save the fifth child and save a lot of money to society and make a difference to that person. So this is holistic, it's a totally different approach. The Brexit chairman, uh, in an article when you <coughs> were mm. Tiverton candidate yes. relatively recently, uh, said the greatest strength, talking about the candidates, the greatest strength is they're not professional politicians, yes. but competent individuals yes. connected to the local areas and issues that they seek to represent. Is your connection to Wrexham tenuous? No, it's for the rest of my life, and it's certainly my children. My daughter, called Isis, who's nine, said to me, can I come out of school to the end of the campaign and come up and stay with Grandma, which is where I'm staying? And my son wants to be up here. So, so the link here is strong. I've spent 10 years seeing the town, looking at the good and bad of it. Uh, when I buried my father-in-law last year, he'd spent 10 years persuading me to come here because he said it was a brilliant place to be born, live and die. And I think when you look around, there's so many good things in this city and this town. I mean, it should be a city, it's a town. The, the locals seem to lose track of what they really got. So as an outsider who has links, I'm hoping to bring in enthusiasm, build up with the local people so we go forward and really make a difference. Yes. The first way some people uh, saw you saw you standing was at the service of remembrance and you put a tweet out that yes. a fair, fair reaction is probably... Yeah. The well, the wrong reaction. If you read my tweet carefully, I'm saying that we need to go forward so that people who've fought for the country are not left with nowhere to live. They're not being prosecuted. It was really saying to all the candidates, let's talk together for the community. We can campaign on our differences, but we're gonna to have to coalesce together if we're gonna bring this country together after we leave Europe. So really that was taken in the wrong spirit. I didn't respond to it because there's no point. I'm not gonna make political view out of it. It'd be just nice if they actually spoke to each other as human beings, because I don't intend to discuss any of the other candidates. It's the policies that we have and the one real policy is to get Britain going out of Europe with the right trade deal. So that's where I'm coming from. And of course, going forward, we plan to be standing uh, candidates in the Welsh Assembly to deal with the other issues around here, which is NHS is one of them. Uh, talking about getting people talking to each other. Yes, well, we're talking, that's the difference. Yeah. Wouldn't have done if I hadn't have decided to stand, so if yes. you were talking to the Prime Minister <coughs> and Prime Minister's questions... Uh, well, I, I asked the question, I, everybody I see, I say, what question would you put to the Prime well, Minister? That was, that was the question. Yeah. What question would you ask the Prime Minister and what do you hope to uncover by well, asking? I'm not going to give you my question, I will give you that after. I went to see a minor yesterday where we're going to have a TV debate tonight, and he retired, packed in 1987. I said, what question would you ask? He said, why don't you tell the truth? And that was his question. And I suppose my question is, he's given us so many versions of what his treaty is, and he's told us we're leaving and that's it, but that's not honest. 
So from the point of view, if you want to leave, you've got to vote for the Brexit party. And we're the only party that generally is leave. So that question is the question I put. I think it's actually quite a good one. This is the third election for years. Mm. Uh, people say they're fed up with politics, party politics, politicians feel that they're mm. all the same, you know, you never listen anyway. And all that kind of thing. <laughs> What's different about you? I listen, simple as that. Going around the country, and I went to seven of the rallies we had, I was quite <coughs> involved quite a lot in talking to people. What's their policies? And our policies have come from talking to people. Everything I've got here, the policies I'm looking at, is because I've spoken to local people saying, what do we need to do? You know, it's not rocket science to have an advert that says, more people have died here as rough sleepers than anywhere else in Wales, yet the council's sitting on about 44 million extra money. If you took a million pounds and you brought in the expertise from various places and you relocate them in the right place, you could solve that issue with the will. But there isn't anybody that I've met prepared to talk to all the people to get it right. So that's my reason, yes. Not talking about a party manifesto item, no. so hopefully that they can sort those yes. out themselves, yes. but as an MP, you might get the chance to bring in a new law via a private member's bill. If you have that opportunity, what law would you personally seek to bring in? That's a very good question. I think I would talk to the community and see what they want. I have a lot of policies. One of the policies I want to do is to see that the living wage up here reflects the true living wage, which should be nearer £10. It's £9.81. The natural wage, about eight thirty one. A thing I really do think is that anybody under 25 should get the same living wage as somebody over. You've got more costs. That's in one area. I want to look at in terms of women not being paid less. 20% on average. I mean, that's not right in this country. In terms of the community here, planting trees, I'm totally on for that one. There's a site in America, a billion trees worldwide, they say it may reverse. Not well, but it may. That's a good start. Now, if you take that in hand, you neaten up the area, plant the trees, the bushes, we can make a difference to the environment. And in my view, and I've practiced in Wirral, all the tough places around the country, Scunthorpe, if the area looks beautiful, people feel better. That's my view anyway. Aside from Brexit, yes. what do you think is the top issue for Wrexham in the forthcoming parliamentary term? And can you briefly explain to see how, how you see well, the desired outcome can be achieved? There's, there's two issues. Firstly, the support the local authorities withdrawing from disabled people in terms of workability. That's something I want to look at. They say they have a plan, I want to see what it is. But secondly, is in, in terms of the rough sleepers. I mean, it's quite clear there's about 45, 50 of them. I think the police chief has said he hasn't got an integrated policy with the NHS, uh, with adult mental health and things like that. And that's going to be one of my main pledges to this community. I want to make sure we don't have the rough sleepers at the end of my period if I'm elected MP. Now, that's a tall order, but I have the contacts. I'm talking to various industrialists, people with money who are prepared to put together a social policy. If the council are prepared to talk realistically and not try to save money, but to try to save money in the future, then we may have a chance to really make a difference for Wrexham. The Brexit party by name is obviously Brexit yes, focused, yes. Uh, but has some other policies. Are you able to run through a handful not previously mentioned and explain why you think well, it would be good for Wrexham? We don't have our policies, which we are actually pledges. We're not doing, a, 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 as all the other parties do, promises and then ignore them. They're coming out on Friday. What I can say, I've already linked one in, which is, of course, reduction of business rates. I walked around from the town centre, there were about 50, 60 shops empty. You've got a very good uh, start-up uh, practice here. I think it's been going since 2017, it's about a million pound in. If we can link that in and get more shops open up, we're going to neaten the area up. If we can work with the homes people so they don't need to be in the centre of town, so they have the support, we can change the entire environment. And this is something that will be coming out on my campaign, campaign leaflets once I get out there to actually campaign. Uh, you've said previously, uh, I voted for freedom. Yes. No ifs, no buts but just freedom and it's priceless. Totally. What's the last EU law, edict, ruling that's impacted your life in a restricted way and how? Well, if you go back, well, I had a coach business years ago. Um, Margaret Thatcher brought in taxes about people coming overseas. Pretty well wiped out my entire business in six months. I got around it, sorted it out. In terms of the European laws, I think people go on about the employment laws that we have because of Europe. They would have been here anyway. It's just that they have their own particular guidance and regulation. I think the problem with the European rules, and I wouldn't say laws, is that they impose restrictions on British business. I was talking to a farmer down in Cornwall who's 99% of his crops go to Egypt. 20% of his profits are to comply with the European rules, which he says I don't actually need. Now that was quite staggering. I spoke to a fisherman, a really nice guy, who said that he can't fish within six miles of the waters because of the particular restrictions on his quota. But because the French argue for grandfather rights when they were negotiating with the Conservative government in 1975, they got it. We forgot to ask for the same in France. 
this is the real bottom line. The other point, of course, is a lot of the fishermen down in uh, Cornwall at the moment are being prosecuted by the MMOs that see <coughs> inshore um, bodies that look after it, but they're not pursuing the French the same way. So there are a lot of things you can say that European law, maybe we apply them too strictly. The French take a laissez-faire view, which I think is what it, Europe's about, but we've never really been committed to Europe. We, the government, don't work with the MEPs in Europe the same way as Europe does. So overall, I'd say all the rules from Europe need to be looked at. There's no reason why we can't do trade do treaties because we're on a level playing field. We just need to work out what's right for this country. Uh, take back control is yes. a buzzword that's often mentioned. What does that mean to you? Freedom to make your own decisions, make your own mistakes, put them right. I don't need somebody else to take £9 billion a year and tell me where my money should go. Down in Cornwall campaigning, it was quite clear that the money wasn't going where it should do. All the local candidates, including the Lib Dems, were saying, well, we'd actually put it somewhere else. Well, take it away from Europe, do it ourselves, that solves the problem. It is about self-determination. You've previously said uh, a referendum for Northern Ireland to settle the border issue. If no majority for Unite, then an open and agreed border. <coughs> Referendums for Wales and Scotland. Yes. Uh, and then only then can the UK begin to unite again. You've referenced lots of referendums there and a second one for Scotland. Yes. But, uh, you're not referencing a second referendum on Brexit. Why would that be? Well, because if you're going to say that every time you have a vote, it can be ignored. So I'll turn around in two years' time and say in this election, well, I don't agree with it, let's have another one. You've got to accept the decision, and the reason I say the referendum is so important, I haven't found a politician who didn't say this is a final once in a life and we will honour it. And Paddy Ashdown said at the time, one or 20%, you've got to honour it. Now he assumed he was going to win. I think the Liberal Democrats are in an impossible position and should really consider that they should honour it first. I could admire them if they honoured it and then campaigned. I can't admire it when three and a half years down the road they're telling me 17.4 million people, people are stupid, made the wrong decision, and yet they're now trying to say, say to us, well, we'll ignore the next referendum. Now, I agree referendums are right in the right circumstance. Certainly the uh, Conservative government have led the DUP right up the path to the altar and then dump them. And that's why the DUP cannot agree, because they know as a minority, whatever referendum in Northern Ireland, they would lose. And if you look at the Good Friday Agreement, it's a dog's dinner to settle everybody. It got a piece, it got a result. But I guess it's not correct going forwards. And I think it's unfortunate that the European Union has used and I think the Irish, Southern Irish government have used this issue has been a trigger, as they see it, for the Good Friday Agreement to actually look at the future of the two countries. Uh, it's something that the Irish need to sort out. I think from the point of view of us negotiating leave, it was a red herring. Simple as that. The end of this election could see a coalition as an outcome and all the <coughs> candidates... Well, not if I have any say about it. <laughs> all candidates are saying they're going to focus on an outright win. Yes. Uh, but putting that aside to force the direct answer, what would be your most comfortable coalition? A Conservative. Let's be blunt. But we got 274 candidates and Conservatives, we've given them a free pass to some extent. If we can get 274 candidates in, we can really change Parliament. And I think when I talk to people on the streets and I talk to a lot of long-term Labour supporters, and I went round to the Miners' Colliery place yesterday, they were saying, we're going to vote Brexit. We cannot vote Labour. I don't think the public, or I don't think Parliament has realised how much the public have had enough. People like me, I wouldn't be standing here but for the fact that they failed to get a leave on the 29th of March. I would have been doing my life with my children, I wouldn't have been committing. And there's 274, in fact there's 650 people I've met, all as determined as me, and they're all coming in behind the constituencies once we get to the last week. And I think the public are going to really give Parliament the answer that they should have done, get on with the 17.4 million, commit, and then we go forward as a country. How did you vote in the referendum? Leave, no question. I mean, it's quite simple. Uh, it wasn't about deals or anything. It was in and out. It was out so I have the freedom to choose. I wasn't bothered about what the financial settlement was. Freedom is priceless. What are your thoughts on the official uh, 2016 Vote Leave campaign, bearing in mind the illegal electoral payments, and does that affect your confidence in results? No, because I'm standing for Wrexham as a Brexit candidate. What other people do, whatever is a matter for them. I'm happy with the party. I wouldn't go near UKIP because of what I saw. But with this party and everybody I've spoken to, there is no, uh, nobody's upsetting anybody. They're sticking to the line. And from my point of view, that is what a party needs to be. Would you be happy with a no-deal Brexit? And what would you say to people who are greatly worried by such an outcome? Well, if it's a no-deal Brexit, and having read the treaties, and knowing where Europe's going, and I'm not going to say it's a single army now, and it isn't, it's the DEA, it's the defence agreement. And we can opt out of it if our government wants. But by 2022, we will lose that. We're one of the largest standing armies in Europe. 
They need us if they're going to have a defence. But if we really look at the motivation of why the EU is doing what it's doing, it's because they don't want to pay the 2% of their gross domestic product to the Americans, which is the contribution they expect. So they're trying to get it on the cheap. That's, their, in my view, their motivation. Our motivation is we need to control our own borders, we need to have our own policies, and we don't need somebody else telling us what our army should do. So, yes, it's, it's about freedom. What do you understand as being the downside of Brexit for Wales and Wrexham? Uh, and if you are aware of any, what mitigation do you expect? Well, a lot of people shout to me that it's about money. Wales does quite well out of it. Certainly gets more out than it puts in. It's about 600 million a year, puts about 400 million in. But if as a government, and I'm in Parliament, and I know we've got a 9 billion saving, and I know just to sort out the mess around here, let's be honest about the roads is 50 million it needs, I can channel the money in a one-off situation, campaigning for the money to be here. Now, if you look at the NHS, the argument around here is lack of funding, but they're choosing to do it on a per head basis, not on a needs basis. So the Welsh Assembly could, which is a Labour-based Welsh Assembly, actually get a lot more money in for the national health, it's just not doing it. So I'm here for a lot of policies as the rest of the candidates behind me are. Well, doing some research, yes. uh, a party uh, Google I popped up using the term fight for democracy. Yes. Uh, Mr Farage offered an ultimate, uh, ultimatum to Conservatives to effectively do a deal which would by bypass the ballot box to get a political wish. Mm. Are backroom deals by senior politicians the type of democracy that you're backing? And will that really change politics? No, you? not at all. When I had the Sunday uh, Express editor around, deputy editor, I said, talk to all my supporters, talk to everybody, I'll leave you alone. This is open honest. If somebody says something that's wrong, we'll sort it out, we, we discuss it. It's about inclusion, it's not about exclusion. It's about making sure everybody feels part of the community. So why I've looked at the real issue for me is, is the homeless, the rough sleepers. Get them on board, get the community working together. I know there's views that they should try and lock them out. I mean, the council put up a fence, £30,000. I think that's wrong. You need to do the opposite and you actually get them in. So yeah, I, I have no problem going forwards with everybody working with us. Your party leader made what seemed to be, at least publicly, a quick decision not to stand candidates in 300 odd constituencies. Yes. Uh, doesn't it concern you that you can make another overnight decision that will affect the remaining candidates or the party on the win? Well, I think you've got to say that the man's natured, he says 25, I think it's 27 years of his life to get to a position where this country could be free from Europe. So I think his commitment is there. I know his decision making, he listens to a lot of people, there's no question. There's a lot of advisors behind the scenes. He will make a decision. He'll get up in the morning and say, I've decided this morning I'm going to have 50 candidates on the stage. Oh dear, there's no room for me. I better change it. That's a human way of doing things. I think the real policies are very well thought out. I trust what he's done. He'd made the right choice because traveling around the country, he's focusing the press in each of the seats that matter to us. If he'd stood, we wouldn't be getting any publicity from the major press. It's as simple as that. And I also think after standing seven times, he's saying, well, I'm going to let somebody else have a chance, and then I can always come back later. I wouldn't write him off. I think he's made just the right tactical decision for our party. And that's obviously what we've done where we step back where the Conservatives are concerned. There was a clear risk. We'd all spotted it. So we've managed to remove the risk of a Labour government that's gone. That won't happen. I can assure the voters we won't let that happen. Uh, it's fair to say Brexit is a divisive topic. Uh, I, don't, no, I, I don't know. I mean, it's united the country in two senses. We've got one half win one way and one half going the other. Which is the point of the question. Yes, it is. FNP, you'd be elected for the constituency. Yes. How would you work to represent those who don't vote for you and that you have well, an opposing point of view on? I think firstly, the people that didn't and weren't in the majority have to accept that if you win an election, the winner does have a chance to go forward with some of their policies and would basically rule what's going on. But it's working and talking to people. I liken where we are now to about 1938, 39. The country came together with a threat from Europe. And we're in the same position. Europe will see us as the enemy in the sense that we could take a lot of their business and their trade. So they want to tie us down. They want to put a, neck, a, a rope around our neck and say, you move, we're going to stop you. So from my point of view, this is as serious as that because we're fighting for the economic survival for this country going forwards. And I'd invite everybody to come and talk to me. I offered that on my tweet on Armistice Day, it can backfire, but that's a matter for people's perception. Once they talk to me, they'll probably find a different approach. I'm not your usual MP, and I'm certainly not going to make the mistakes. The chap said to me yesterday in the colliery, if I vote for you, you're going to go into Parliament and lie. I said, well, if you do, kick me out. Simple as that. Uh Speaking of perhaps not kicking out, but leaving the Parliament, <laughs> yes. say Brexit is delivered, can yes. you stand down and call an election because surely the job would be done? No. Brexit is not just about Brexit. Of all the candidates I've met on when we were interviewed, I had to make a commitment to 
pack in my work as a solicitor and really focus on the party going forwards. There's a lot of issues in Wales and they need to be dealt with and it needs the Welsh Assembly. I've already said yes, I will stand in the Welsh Assembly if I don't get elected here. So this is long-term commitment. I think the major parties have got a bit of a shock because this is people like myself who said we've had enough of being misled and lied to and you can't trust them. Simple as that. Have you got anything else to say to potential voters watching this? Yes, vote for me. What a future we're going to have. That's it.